Hello, investors. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are so excited to keep you updated and uh, pat yourself on the back for joining us and staying relevant with what's going on in the market. I'm Destiny Fernandes, the Marketing Manager for Catalyst Funding. Before we dive in, I want to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, that you will receive a copy via email tomorrow. And if you have any questions during the presentation or for our speakers specifically, write them in the question box and I will go ahead and ask them at the end. Lastly, one lucky winner that has joined us live today will be the recipient of half of their next hard money processing fee with Catalyst Funding. We will announce the winner just before we open for questions at the end. We love providing this monthly webinar as a tool to help you in assessing the current market and the future market. However, we do want to note Catalyst and our associates and or guests are not liable for any investment decisions you make hereafter. Please always conduct your own due diligence before moving forward with the deal, or you can feel free to call us and speak directly with one of our trusted advisors and fully licensed loan officers. They can talk to you specifically about what you're investing in and what your next deal is. Next, I'd like to welcome Jeff Smith. Jeff is a multifamily and single family sales manager at, the Li at Lifestyles Unlimited. He's a second generation investor with over 20 years of experience and has been recognized by the Houston Association of Realtors as a top producer 10 times. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, thanks for having me. And I'll say a few things about Jeff as well and then let him tell uh, everybody a little bit about what he does. But um, you know, Lifestyles Unlimited is arguably the most influential mentorship organization of single and multifamily investors in the entire country. And Jeff leads their biggest, most influential location here in Houston, for sure. We've known him for a long time. He's a great partner. He's he's helped so many people become uh, you know, financially independent and accomplish their goals in real estate. Incredibly knowledgeable guy, and we are super excited to have him here today. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, I got started investing in real estate with uh, uh, my, my I married into a real estate family. So my my wife's father was a real estate investor and um, it, re it really just took off from there. Um, he insisted I join Lifestyles Unlimited as a member to to really learn how to, to do this. He, you know, he didn't really want to take the time to um, deal with me if I didn't <laughs> if I didn't invest in me, too. Right. And so um, so so I did that and, and it really took off. An interesting thing about him is that uh, his, his introduction to real estate investing was he was an IRS agent by by trade. Right. He audited a real estate investor in 1980 or 1981. And then um, by 1982, he was a real estate investor. <laughs> so. So that's uh, that. That's how he found it. So it, 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 interesting guy. I you know he, we, we lost him uh, almost ten years ago. So, uh, but uh, I'm grateful to uh, to have known him and uh, and for all of the things he taught me. And it, it it's been a fun ride. And and for him to introduce me to Lifestyles Unlimited has been uh, super helpful for me in in more than just teaching me. Um, really how to get started, but um, it's actually become my calling as well in, in, in a way that I, and I can use this in a way to really help other people follow that same path. Wow, that's Good awesome. Deal. Yeah, so uh, Jeff, I don't know, a lot of the folks may not know about Lifestyles. Do you, do you want to tell them just kind of briefly what Lifestyles is and what y'all do? Absolutely. Yeah, so Lifestyles and so there, so I work for Lifestyles Realty, which is a, a like a sister company to Lifestyles Unlimited. So I'll start with Lifestyles Unlimited uh, because that's the one that you pro most of mo most folks know about. Lifestyles Unlimited is a real estate investors mentor group, and so Lifestyles Unlimited teaches people how to become real estate investors, and and really takes them from uh, learning how to do it and then guiding them through it. They're, they, you know, from, from buying that first, first rent house to, uh, uh, you know, a small apartment, several hundred unit apartment complexes. We have, we have members who have uh, bought 
several several hundred unit apartment complexes um and and everything in between so so the 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 group is is large it's it's grown considerably it's been around for 31 years i think 32 years i i mentioned my father-in-law he joined lifestyles in like 1991 or 92 i joined lifestyles in 2000 um uh, you know i bought my first my first rent house in to that, I joined in like February of 2000, got my first deal under my belt in uh, two or three months later. And, um, uh, you know, I was able to leave my, I had enough passive income that uh, I was able to leave my job in a couple of years. So it was, uh, um, and that's really what, what, the, what the goal is, 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 is build enough passive income with, with your real estate investments that you are then free to pursue whatever your calling is. If that calling is to, um, you know, stay home and raise a family as it, as it was for my wife early on. Now that has changed to my, my daughter turned 18 yesterday. So, you know, that's a, a you know, her, 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 um, her calling has changed through the years, right? If you're calling, it, it might be that you're already working, uh, in your field that is your calling, but having the passive income allows you to do it in a way that is uh, um, freer and maybe on your own. Uh, wh whatever it is that is your calling, having the passive income allows you to do it in 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 a, in a much freer way, a less stressful lifestyle, and that's really where the name comes from. It's it's really, it really is about the lifestyle. Lifestyle Realty, the sister company to Lifestyles Unlimited, is uh, um, uh, that's that's the uh, company I'm with, and my team of agents, super strong team of agents, uh, award-winning agents uh, that uh, we get out there and we help uh, the 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 folks who go through the training at Lifestyles execute, right? Our, our agents will get out there and help them with acquiring the properties that, uh, that, that the Lifestyles Unlimited members, uh, you know, once they've learned how to do it, we get out there and help them execute uh, on, on the Lifestyles Realty side. Um, and I, I'll add to that, like uh, the number of people that we have seen um, and been privileged enough to help with the lending through Lifestyles Unlimited who have just added, you know, 10, 20, 30 properties and, and, and even more have really been astounding. So uh, Jeff and his team definitely make the process as easy as possible. Real estate investing is not easy, but if you have great partners and mentors, it can be a heck of a lot easier. And everybody that we know says that, you know, their membership fees are reasonable and totally valuable to get the expertise and avoid some of the mistakes that investors can make if they don't have that that mentorship and guidance it's a huge huge benefit to all of them super helpful to me and i hope we can be you know and we, we can pay it forward no doubt great awesome we are so glad to have you on the call today and if you're joining us for the first time let me introduce our other two speakers we have our founder and ceo wade como on the call Welcome. And we have our director of lending, Jeff Johnson, on the call as well. Uh, Wade started his career in 1995. He is an active real estate agent and active investor himself outside of just having over 20, 20 years of experience in lending. So information that you're going to hear from Wade today is incredible. Do be sure to ask questions if you have any during the call. And Jeff Johnson oversees all of our lending operations in-house. You may have even worked with him if you've done a deal with us. And he has over 20 years of experience in the lending and real estate investment side as well. So we have a full, excellent panel for us today. Be sure to ask questions if you have any while you're on. And we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Wade, I think I'm passing the torch to you. Is that right? Absolutely. Um going to cover a few things that, that we offer at Catalyst, what our basic value proposition is. We really want to be a one-stop shop for your hard money and permanent uh, financing loans. We do specialize in the space, not only of, of doing hard money to for people who want to flip properties, but we have some very specialized products and a very integrated process for those who want to do buy and hold investing. Um, we are 
real estate lenders built by real estate investors. You know, many of our teammates, including some very young employees on our team, have been able to add rental properties to their portfolio. As Destiny mentioned, our company also owns a pretty large single family portfolio as well. So we definitely believe in the model. We try to take that experience to help you avoid some of the mistakes that we've made and support great mentors like Lifestyles and Limited as well. Um, we have a single point of contact model, which is unique to some of our competitors in that as a, a borrower, you're going to have one loan officer who's your trusted advisor and expert for all the different products you need. That could be an owner-occupied purchase, a refi, cash out loan to fuel your real estate investments, and then especially real estate investment products from hard money to purchase and repair distressed real estate to a wide variety of permanent products, which we'll talk about in a, in a second to hold them. Um, our hard money loans start as low as 6.99% and two points, and we have special VIP flip programs as well with options as low as 1.9.99%. We have some very exciting products that are for non-qualified loans, and that basically means if you don't have the income to support getting a conventional loan, we have excellent products for you. Um, and we also have blanket loans, which can take a significant amount of properties. It could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, um, even you know, 100 properties potentially, put them into one easy payment with very attractive terms and even clean up and, and renew your ability to start using conforming loans to, to buy properties after that. So very exciting product there. And we have some specialized uh, Airbnb or RBO short-term rental type products that we're very excited about that allow you to buy larger properties and vacation type areas or other areas where there's a large attraction to short-term rentals and get you into those properties. And some of the returns on those properties are incredibly exciting as well. Very new area, but incredibly exciting returns uh, that we'll talk about uh, you know, a little bit today and, and also into the future. Yeah, just to uh, piggyback off that, the one space or segment of our business that I've seen grow the most by a lot is the long-term non-QM loans and blanket loans. Jeff, I don't know if you have a lot of people you talk about financing with your, your members, but um, if you are a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor, but maybe you don't have the income to qualify for conventional loans, there are a ton of people doing non-conventional loans. The rates are very similar. The, the, the gap between a conventional loan and non-conventional loan is not very wide. Um, so a lot of folks are getting into those non-QM loans to be able to be landlords, but don't have the maybe the income or Maybe they've got too many and they can't do any more uh, conventional loans. Really big product worth right now. All right. So uh, I'll take this one. This is, we always include this um, because it is one of the biggest reasons for the real estate market that we're in right now. Um, this is a list of housing starts by decade. It goes all the way back to the 1960s. And as you can see, there are certain periods of spikes and, and drops. Um, but if you look at recent history, the last 10 years, you'll notice that it's very low, right? There was no spike, even the highest point, which is now is kind of midpoint maybe for the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, the time period. So these, um, this is basically just a picture of how many homes are being built. So when you couple that along with the fact that the population is growing significantly, those two factors will lead to what we have, which is now a shortage of inventory. Uh, and one of the articles we talk about later, so the, the guy's opinion is that it would literally take years for us to build out of the shortage we have right now. Um, so this is just, like I said, this shows what was happening in the past as what was the build and that you can see they're, they're they're shooting upwards trying to catch up but they still have a long ways to go so one of the one of the one of the things that's striking about this is you, you mentioned that the population is increasing and and the building is that you know the the number of housing starts is considerably lower and you mentioned the last 10 years if you if you were to break that out by decade uh the national association of home builders uh i i forget when i included i included a um some data in a in a talk i did about a year ago 
where the National Association of Home Builders broke it out by decade, going back, I think it was to 1960. And they broke it out and said how they broke it out where they adjusted it by population. And they said and they they pointed out the the housing starts per million of population. Mm -hmm. And it, it and over the last 10 years, it was 21 how 21,000 housing starts per million of population. And for every decade prior, it was at least 41. Wow. Wow. So it was half. And and there were a couple of those decades where it was 50. So, so if it's very striking if you if you look at it population adjusted. It's I mean this is striking, but it's even more striking when it's population adjusted. And when you think about um, their ability to replenish the inventory that that we're buying as investment properties, um, because if you think about what people are renting if 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 we look at at the price point that we buy as rental properties you know we're 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 catering to people who are 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 blue collar generally working class people and and the median income in Harris County anyways $62,000 per household you know if if we're if we're qualifying them on 3 3 to 4 times the um the their income in uh or or their rent in income at sixty two thousand dollars that's five thousand dollars a month that's right around fifteen hundred dollars max rent a month you know what kind of a payment supports that mm. rent or that you know what 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 ballpark are we in on price mm -hmm. and um um, you know, can a builder build a property at that price? I mean, that's one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar price point for a fifteen hundred dollar, give or take twenty percent, a month payment. Can a builder build at that price point, given the price of land, given the price of labor, given the price of materials mm. and regulation? Yeah, I don't think I don't think they can. No. Yeah, it's a. Uh... That, that's a that's a very good point and um yeah i was looking at the the population to to just point i don't have the exact you know adjusted numbers but population in 1960 thousand. population you know today somewhere 335 i'm sorry million my bad million right now yeah so but i mean it's just a huge increase and the peak even now whenever we feel like we're probably building more houses than we or we definitely are building more houses than we have in this entire decade still not at a peak from any time, even back in the 60s, 70s, every, every decade had a number that was way higher than where we're at now, right? It's just amazing to see, really amazing to see. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a, a an article out of the journal that uh, home price growth hit a record in 2021. Case Shiller Index uh, shows that the major metros rose 18.8%. Uh, that calendar year increase was the highest since the index began in 1987. So just a, a huge year over year increase. Um, home price growth decelerated in recent months and is expected to slow further in 2022. We've been saying that for a while. Um, deceleration is a very important word. That does not mean depreciation, which I, I, I see. I don't see a way to really project that there are a couple people that do out of the prognosticators, very few overall. Um, but I do definitely do not see another 18.8, and there's not a lot of people that see that either. Although, candidly, I think that may be more likely than um, going backwards <laughs> in some ways. 100 so. percent. Like that is way more likely, in my opinion. I, I don't. The guys that say it's going to go backwards, I'm not quite sure how. But. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But with inflation doing what it's doing, which we'll talk about in a bit, and then on top of that, the, you know, the uh, shortage, extreme shortage of homes out there, it's it's hard to see that. You know, some interesting, uh, I, I found this fascinating, not that it necessarily impacts us as much here in Texas, but I know that Lifestyles Unlimited does have uh, an office in Phoenix. And to see that Phoenix has been, and, and we double checked this, and unless these guys are completely wrong uh, from uh, CoreLogic, uh, 31 straight months of the fastest home price appreciation there in Phoenix. That's kind of a, an amazing statistic. And then Tampa down in Florida was uh, in, in the second place at 29.4. Are you guys yeah, doing Phoenix? deals in Phoenix? We we do deals in Phoenix more multifamily than single family, um, 
because the, you know Phoenix is a uh, is experiencing tremendous growth, and it's a um, it, it's like Austin. It's it's just getting it, it's growing faster than than builders can handle. It's growing. You know, it, people aren't moving out as fast enough for there to be. Uh, it's just the, the absorption. They're not able to absorb the the growth, and so there's just no in no inventory, no inventory available. It's so we're seeing multifamily transactions, but it's it's tough to get a house there. Um, mm. The prices are really high. Let me back up. It's tough to get a rental house sure. to, to make a rental house work in in Phoenix. So it's um, so we're seeing more multifamily activity. I think that's the same thing in Austin, right? Austin, you, you unless you're buying a at minimum a duplex, a triplex or quadplex, and then and then more often multifamily, it's very difficult to make a, a real estate investment in the core area. You can get out in the right. suburbs, not even the suburbs, the the far outer reaches probably, and maybe <laughs> get some, but definitely not easy to do anywhere near the the major parts of the city. Sure. I'm curious, Jeff, with these increases, like just say in Houston, for example, because that's your market. Are you guys? Because I know. Obviously, you're not the the end user. Isn't everything you guys do? Um, are, are you seeing a slowdown in the off market deals, or or no? Like, because just as prices are going up, you know, it's getting a little tougher. I imagine it, you guys. it is. It, it it is getting tougher. But our um, you know, Wade mentioned deceleration in in pricing, right? For years, we've seen an acceleration in transaction volume also right the number of the number of units we move and um and so the number of units we move while increasing that increase is slowing you know we're not you know so yeah. it, it's not like it's not that we're we're seeing fewer but the increase is, is not as robust as it was um <laughs> That's encouraging, though, that you guys and the, the the values going up the way they do, and like you said, the rent that that kind of getting squeezed a little bit. That's that's great that you guys are still doing more deals than you did yesterday. Yeah, I think we talked about that before we turned the before we turned the camera on, though, right? So, so we, you know, the the rent lagging, the the price increase. So the rent increases are coming, right? We are seeing rent increases, but. Um, they're they're behind the price increases so uh for you know any prospective landlords who are who are watching you know your initial evaluation of a property based on based on historical rents um you know you, your 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 projected rents are uh um are, are I I think you're you'll be more optimistic when you look at your projected rents than when you look at historical rents. So what you're saying is don't just automatically renew. Do some do some do some comps. When you yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So this is a continuation of that same article. Uh, kind of more of the same. So it's first time home buyers are struggling to compete against cash buyers and investors. Uh, the share of first-time home buyers in the market fell to 27% in January, which is down from 33% a year ago. Um, the average rate, now this is something that was on the previous slide, the average rate on 30-year fixed uh, was 3.92 as of Thursday. Um, you see different numbers depending on where you find them or what, how they, what they call average, I guess. Um, that's according to Freddie, Freddie Mac. It's the highest it's been since May of 2019. Uh, and then the case Schiller 10 city index gained 17% over the year uh, in December compared with 17% in November. The 20 city index rose 19% after an annual gain of 18% uh, in November. Price growth accelerated in 15 of the 20 cities. Uh, economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal expected the 20 city index to gain 18%. Um, a couple of things that I, I thought was interesting that was uh, we didn't use as a bullet point, but was in the article. Uh, in January 2020, it was the lowest level of homes for sale in the country since they started measuring that metric, which was in, I believe, 1999. 
So just sheer homes for sale in the last 20 years, it's the lowest it's ever been. That's why I say, Wade, when you're talking about people saying it's gonna go down, I just, I have a hard time believing that the, the prices are gonna go down when there's just so few homes for sale right now as we sit. Um, and the other point, it's just, it's gonna take too long for builders to catch up to that demand. Yeah. And we, we've talked about this a little bit in the past too, but another big driver is uh, the federal government's and Fannie Freddie's uh, statements, very clear statements that they're going to handle uh, forbearances differently than they handled them in the past, right? Uh, for those of us that were in the mortgage business back in the previous financial crisis, a huge difference was that people were required to make all of their past due payments at one time. So if they hadn't made a payment in 12 months, 18 months, uh, it was unrealistic to think that all of a sudden they could make all those payments in one month, right? Uh, conversely, I think we all learned our lesson from that, and uh, they have said that they're going to allow those payments to be tacked on to the end, which is entirely different. And I think a much better approach to avoiding all the foreclosures that really impacted prices back in 2008, 2009, right? So I think that's another big driver is just the, how we are going to handle people who are now in a spot where they can't make their mortgage payments anymore. Anything to add to that, Jeff? Are you ready for the next slide? No, I'm I'm good. I now well, I will add one thing: is that the um, um, I I, sh I probably should have sent it to you previously, but there's a National Association of Realtors um, economist, I, uh, uh, chief economist Lawrence Yoon. He a few months back he he put out a, a post that mentioned that. Uh, the vast majority of those properties that went into um, into those agreements, those forbearance agreements, they were resolved. Yes. They, they, they're already done. It's already settled. And so whatever shadow inventory of distress that you may hear about, most of it's already most of it's already resolved and settled and they're moved on down the road. Agreed. It makes total sense. Just think about it. If you're really in that big back back when this happened in 08 or 09, like the values had gone down. So if you were in trouble, you really didn't have many options. Now, even if you were in trouble, equity is so great and appreciation, just sell the house, right? You, right. There's always the exit of just getting out and selling the house. Yeah, well, it, it, well, you've got that piece plus prior to the problems in 08 and 09, there were irresponsible lenders All right. yeah. and and this time if you if you guys are um if you guys get the report the mcai report from the mortgage bankers association every month the the credit availability index shows you that that the uh that the tightening of credit is i mean it's still super tight mm -hmm. they, they're the, the 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 lending standards never loosened up from from the um, the squeeze 12 years ago and yep. you, you, there's never been any kind of irresponsible lending on top of what Jeff just said with with everybody having equity you've got responsible borrowers so for the most part you don't really there shouldn't be as much distress out there at all and what there is was settled yeah to, to your point the average fico score of borrowers mortgage borrowers today the average debt to income ratio the fact that all owner occupants are required to prove their ability to pay where we had a lot of no doc programs for owner occupants in the past which make up the large majority of people who borrow for their homes it's an entirely different circumstance to just point like it's so different um, okay, next slide here is an interest rate slide, and we've, we've been talking uh, for quite some time about interest rates eventually will, will, will go up, and we're seeing that very quickly right now. Like I, It is very, uh, very impressive how quickly things have happened in both the non-QM space, the non-qualified mortgage space that Jeff really talked about a lot earlier, and the conforming space. Now, still, we are at incredibly historically low rates, right? And and you can still have excellent cash flowing properties, but interest rates are on the rise. And we really encourage people to lock in while you can. May not be better for quite some time. And what's really interesting about this slide is whenever Jeff was talking earlier about his uh, his father-in-law, I guess, 
getting into the business in 1981, that was a time whenever interest rates and inflation were like at near all time highs, definitely recent highs, right? For the last 40, 50 years, interest <laughs> rates were, you know, inflation was 18%, rates were 18%. And I looked at his balance sheet and he still had some of those loans on his balance sheet in the late 90s, uh -huh. 15, 16% interest rates. <laughs> he he hadn't bothered to refinance them because they they had such low they had such yeah. low balances at the time, but <laughs> it's just cash flowing like crazy with sixteen percent interest yeah. rate. Right? Yeah, that's right, <laughs> and that just shows you the power of inflation, right? Because as as uh, and that's a great thing about locking in now. If you can lock in at low rates now at prices that may seem uh, like you feel like, man, I, I might be overpaying a, a touch here, but um, if you're able to lock in at incredibly low rates, as rates continue to rise, investors next year and the year after and the year after, if rates are eight or nine or 10 or God forbid, higher interest rate, they must charge more to cash flow, right? So that's a, it's a great thing to lock in at low rates, which we still can have historically rates now. But just a little bit about what um, the Fed and other people talked about. Uh, Jerome Powell has hinted at more aggressive approach to raising interest rates in order to fight inflation. And um, we've seen uh, projections of maybe uh, you know, six, eight rate hikes uh, next year, maybe even more, um, depending on the prognosticator. He did, he did say he expects inflation to drop below 3% by the end of the year, but candidly, he's someone who's called inflation transitory and, and said that he didn't project any of the numbers we're seeing now. So um, thus far, he has not been extremely accurate. So I would, I would take that with a, a bit of a grain of salt. Um, and, and one thing that's important to understand is that the, raise, the raises that they're going to make are with the uh, Treasury uh, Tenure, right? That's a very different thing. It does not directly correlate to mortgage interest rates, but the impact is definitely there. Um, they they do move somewhat in tandem, but not directly correlated. That's a very big difference. Um, this particular article does say that uh, many expect six Fed funds rate increases next year, and that the first one on March 16th, which is going to be a very pivotal time for interest rate, if it is a half point uh, number, then half point increase uh i don't think that's going to cause like a huge jump because it's in large part baked in if it happens to be more than that or less than that is when i think you'll see the variance because in these situations whenever it's already projected and the projection is somewhat consensus a lot of it is baked in at that point but it will be a very interesting time they could go three quarter right or they could potentially pull down to a quarter more likely than not it's going to be a half point at that time though um anything else to add to that gentlemen you know what I would say is if you look at the chart, it's basically it's, it's estimating that interest rates for mortgages are going to go up about a half a point for a 30 year fixed. So, I mean, if you really think about that, that's still really, really low. That's still pretty darn good. Um, you know, obviously lower is better, but if we're talking, if you like the chart, you know, Jeff was talking about earlier historically, to go up a half a point on these deals, it's still a really, really good deal. And that, and honestly, I don't know if a half a point is enough to move the needle where you're going to have this massive impact on real estate prices. I just, I don't think it's that much of a difference in the payment for a half a point. Um, it'll have a minor impact, but I don't think it's going to be that much at all. Yeah. The only other thing I'll say real quick before Jeff turn it over to Jeff is that if you look at the chart on inflation and interest rates over time historically, they often run somewhat consistent so uh that 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 time whenever uh just father-in-law started getting into the game those those were both at peaks right um and and also another thing is is that uh gas prices were at an all-time peak because gas prices influence almost all parts of the inflationary curve right because gas prices are a big part of inflation but they also influence so many other things from plastics and and uh shipping costs so oftentimes inflation it, it's it's been somewhat detached for the last 30 years, but in times of, of really big uh, gas price increases, whenever inflation is already there, it could definitely have an upward trend. Jeff, tell us what you guys think. Well, I've been telling my team that um, investors are going to look at this and look at how the rate increase affects their operational income, right, or their their operating expenses. The interest rate the, the interest expense is an operating expense. It hits their bottom line. It change, It's going to reduce their cash on cash return. And so many of their many of our clients will buy will will move some of their buying their planned buying 
to earlier in the year rather than later in the year. If you're thinking, if you're thinking six rate hikes this year, we were thinking three to four. We, you know, either way, more more of our clients are going to buy earlier than the earlier in the year uh, than they had planned to say at the end of last year. And so we're just we're our plan is just to be ready, just to just to to be ready to help as many of our clients as possible uh, to to move on investment properties as soon as soon as they're ready. And um, you know I, I I presume that you guys you guys are prepared for the same thing as well. You guys are anticipating a higher demand earlier than um, than than you would have expected. Uh, had things been, you know, more level. Next slide. All right, so uh, this came from an article from Fortune a couple weeks ago, the mother of all sellers markets. Um, so a couple of things, uh, a new poll by Fannie uh, finds that only 25% of home buyers think it's a good time to buy while 69 are convinced it's a good time to sell. Uh, Fanny's poll also indicates that younger people surveyed are about 40% more convinced um, than the general survey audience that now is a good time to stay away from home ownership, with only 15% of respondents agents, I'm sorry, ages 18 to 34 thinking it's a good time to buy. So people are thinking it's a bad time to buy, and young people are more so than the rest. Um, People were also more convinced about job stability than in the past results, uh, despite last week's surprisingly strong January jobs report. Years over higher mortgage rates were also a big reason behind last month's pessimistic outlook on the housing market. Uh, I, there was two things that I, I thought about this. One, there was another thing in there that if we didn't put on the slide, but two thirds of buyers that are in the market made offers without even seeing the house nationwide. So people are getting pretty desperate to, to make offers and get deals. Two thirds made an offer on a house they didn't even see. The other thing is I think people are getting a little, I think that job thing is, has more to do with inflation and interest rates. As, as inflation goes up, people raise rates. Eventually when you raise rates, this will slow down the economy in general. Um, so that's the, the only thing I can think of as to why people are a little fearful with regards to the jobs report. Um, but it's just kind of more of what we've been talking about. There's just, there's not enough inventory. There's tons of people wanting to buy houses. And if you're a seller, you're in a great spot. Look, I, I've received two offers this this week on on properties I have for sale that were, that were where the buyers never toured the property. Hmm. They never saw the property. It was matter of fact, they they weren't even in state. Um, so that that's a real thing. They there there are buyers who will buy uh, all cash without without contingencies, um, without even seeing the property. Um, now, in my case, the the buyers you know their agents toward the property. Um, so, you know, they they had someone go make sure that it was standing. <laughs> that, yeah. You know that it, you know that you didn't open the back door and there was no back wall, but um, you know you open the but 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 still it's it's a strong it's a strong market. Now I will say though that um, I will say that I I you guys mentioned earlier that you don't see a a way that the people who are expecting a, a market downturn, uh, you don't see a way they can be right. I don't either, right? Builders can't replenish the inventory. They, there's not a way for them to to get in, and and certainly not at the at the price points for starter for starter homes. Exactly. Um, there's uh, the, it doesn't seem like property owners have any interest in in moving. Uh, at any level to provide any any level of inventory, so you're not going to get. You're, it doesn't look like you have. Um, you, you're not going to get any inventory from existing homeowners, and the 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 uh, and the demand isn't doesn't seem to be 
dissipating either. I mean, interest rates have been going up for several months and sales continue to go up. In fact, if you look at, you know, HAR in Houston, the Houston Association of Realtors tracks showings. Showings are still going up as rates are going up. In addition, if you look at the pending sales report, the pending sales report continues to show increases. The closings report continues to show increases. It doesn't look like that um, a reversal is, is imminent. So, you know, how many of those rate hikes will it take to, to for, you know, for, for that to change? I don't know. I don't know, but it's, you know, certainly the ones we've seen haven't, yeah, that's the thing, thing the fact that I mean, articles that I've read is that it's it's the they're having supply chain issues again with materials for builders. Like it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, so right. it's you would think, okay, well, coronavirus is is down the road a little bit, maybe things are gonna loosen up. That's not the case. Like it's not any easier right now to build a house than it was a year or two ago. No, it's not. And I think whenever we show that affordability index report at the end, uh these people, I'm assuming, Jeff, that are buying sight unseen or coming from out of state where despite the fact that prices in Texas are going up, if you're coming from a coastal area, you're still like, wow, I can get a 4,000 square foot house for this price or a right. 500 square Like it's it's so unbelievable to them comparatively that I think that's why people are willing to do it. It just looks like a home run, even if they haven't walked around in it, right? All right, um, I'm going to very briefly cover this and then move into the next slide because we are we need to pick up our pace just a touch. Historical interest rates, we talked about it earlier. You look at, uh, it seems like, oh man, we're, we're going to be at 4.22%. Feels a little bit high from the recent times, but 18%, 16% in the previous extreme inflationary period, it, that is how they got the prices back in line, right? That's how they got inflation to drop was by significant and rapid uh, interest rate increases. So um, we don't know where we're going, but that is a possibility and it's something just to keep in mind. Well, let's go over to uh, the next slide, Houston Har And Jeff, I'll cover this one since I just went briefly there. Um, sure. So in Houston, we've got some uh, continually uh, strong data. Uh, property sales um, did have an increase of 9.3%. A total dollar volume, of course, way up. Active listings, and this has been an ongoing trend every month, active listings way down. But there's so much velocity in the market that that still ends up meaning that in many instances, the total number of sales has been uh, relatively steady or up overall. Um, average sales price up 16.2% year over year, median up 17.9, very strong numbers. Um, a couple of other interesting tidbits here. Year over year, days on market fell from 48 to 39. Um, let's see, single family home price, I climbed 16.2% for the highest ever in January, for January. And then uh, one thing that we always talk about down here in the bottom is the rent rates. So if you if you had a rental property pre-COVID, right, back in February 2022, the average rent rate here in Houston was 1768. That number is now um, 2070. So that's uh, over a $400 increase. I'm sorry, no, it's $300 increase, which is a really big deal. If you were cash flowing three, four hundred bucks before, that number potentially doubled. So while it does not look as big of a number relative to the overall rents, it's a very big number relative to your cash flow. And that's why when Jeff was saying earlier, you're going to be happier a year or two down the road than looking in in the past. I think that's an absolutely true statement. Definitely. Well, if you're if if you're if if your cash flow went up. $3,600 a year and for a typical, um, for, for a typical rent house, you know, what, what are you guys seeing? Most, most landlords are, are putting in, you know, your, your end cash out of pocket, 20, 30 grand. Um, I think, I think it's still, we don't see a whole lot of twenties. Okay. If, if you're getting it from a wholesaler, that's not very common. I think 30 plus most right. common we do see people who are doing their own marketing hell they might be at 15 or 20 but um that, yeah that's, but but you once you throw in their overhead you're back up to whatever everybody else is yeah i mean you're absolutely right because they're paying 
tons of money in marketing to get a house. I mean, I, I, I know some guys, average cost per buy now, you know, might be five to 10 K depending on how efficient they are. So, yeah. So, so if, if you run at 30, right. And you, you bought it at, at with a $400 a month cash flow. Um, you were at 4,800 to begin with. That's a 16% cash on cash return. And you just added another, another $3,600 a month. I mean, you're, you're now at, you're now making a 25, 30% cash on cash return on, on, on your investment just because you kept it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I, you know, I, I, I just, I, I, uh, I tell you what, now, now the, the one thing that the one, the one part, the one thing on this slide that I, that I point out every time I share it in my in my uh, talks at, at Lifestyles, if if there's only one metric that that you really have the bandwidth to follow, if you're busy, but you want to keep your thumb on the pulse of the market, and but and you you can't really follow much, follow months of inventory, mm -hmm. um, because that considers both supply and demand. Um, pieces at the same time right and so and if you're if you're looking at uh you know a, a market that is considered to be an equilibrium is is six months of inventory and if you look here we're at 1.4 months we've got a long way to go before we get anywhere near a a market shift a market shift if we're at 1.4 and we've got to get to seven for there to be a switch from a seller's market to a buyer's market, we've got a long way to go. And and we went from, you know, and we went the other direction, <laughs> right? This number is going from 1.7 to 1.4. So right now we're headed the other way. Wait till we so, get to Austin. What's that? Yeah. Wait till we get to Austin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if there's only one thing to, if you, if you only have uh, enough time to follow one thing, follow that. Uh, I added this chart just because I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, it covers, like you were saying, Jeff, if you just hold on to these properties, right, with all the appreciation we've had over the last five years, if you were to, to buy the average price five years ago in Houston, your value is up 37%. And if you were to buy the median price, your average is up 47%. So um, in dollars, obviously that's a lot of money, right? You've made probably $100,000, I think, between both slides in just five years in equity. Um, mm -hmm. So it really shows the power of, of these properties to hold on. Yeah, what a fun exercise is, and, and I've done this before. I did this about five years ago because it was, 10 years after the peak, right? We had a crash in 2008. So in 2007, you have a peak. So in 2017, to make it more exciting, I, I held up a map uh, on, a, on a cork board of, of uh, the Houston area MLS market numbers and gave, gave people steel tip darts and said, throw it at the map. And just to make it more exciting, I held the map. Right. No, nobody hit my fingers. It was good. <laughs> and then we looked and see how much money you made if you bought a house at full price during the peak 10 years later. And and nobody lost money. So it was a fun exercise. It was a fun exercise. So, it, you know, it's uh, um, it might be a fun thing to do again. Um, but it's cheating now because we've had such <laughs> it's such yeah. a good five years. <laughs> You might not recover quite as quickly from uh, your fingers getting hurt this time. You know, we're a little that, older now, Jeff. That's right. <laughs> Jeff, you want to cover San Antonio? Or do you want me to do it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, San Antonio and Jeff, you can speak to this. I, I know you guys have a, a, a group out in Central Texas. Um, San Antonio is pretty similar. There's one little difference, but um, so the number of sales, just total transactions, between this year and last is pretty flat, down 1%. The average price, as you can see, just like everywhere else, up 17%. The median price is up 18%. Uh, 
Um, they measure price per square foot, which is kind of cool. Um, days on market, uh, like Jeff said, it's kind of, you know, months of inventory and days on market are kind of, kind of in the same universe. They're down 26%. Um, the thing that I wanted to point out was down, down low, uh, look at the rents, the average rents um, on the rentals, the average price is up 13%. So Jeff, I don't know if you're doing deals, if you guys do a lot of deals in San Antonio, um, I think Houston was around 2,000 and San Antonio is 1,700. So it does seem like you can get a little more, a little more rents in Houston relative to San Antonio. We, we Well, San Antonio is interesting because you, you know, you mentioned that, um, you know, the, the cash required to get into a deal in, in Houston is in that $30,000 range. It's, it's not, not as much in San Antonio. Um, uh, but the cash on cash returns are very similar. So mm -hmm. your, you know, so you, so your, your cash flow dollars are less, your cash invested dollars are less, uh, but your cash, but your rate of return is very similar. Um, I, you know, I'd mentioned earlier, my daughter turned 18 yesterday and she's perusing colleges right now. She's basing in large part where she goes to school on where I'm willing to invest with her. San Antonio is at the top of her list because she likes the deals available in San Antonio, partly because she can buy more of them for the same, for the same number of dollars. And, um, and, and that's one of the reasons Lifestyles Realty is expanding our realty team there. Uh, I think we've doubled or tripled our, the size of our team there in the last three or four months. So wow, um, really? we're really high on San Antonio. And the other thing about San Antonio is San Antonio is in the top 10 list of uh, uh, places where people are relocating in the country, yeah. uh, San Antonio and Dallas. Yeah. Uh, whenever we look at that affordability index in a moment, uh, San Antonio is really it kind of pops off the page for the major metros in Texas. And uh, we hear the same thing from investors. They're getting some really high quality deals. Over there, and the deals, the deals we see coming through our system in San Antonio always look really strong. Uh, next slide, Dallas. So Dallas, while not as expensive as as Austin, obviously, it, it you know Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it does seem like it's a little more difficult to get investments up there. Not as tough as Austin, but more difficult than uh, Houston and San Antonio. And the metrics kind of show uh, some of this now. One thing to keep in mind here, whenever you see this median price, this is the entire North Texas market. So it's a little bit misleading, whereas uh, Houston and San Antonio are kind of looking at the major metros. But um, you can see that the median price has gone up significantly there, in, including some of those tertiary markets, higher than uh, both Houston and San Antonio. Um, active listings are way down. Months of inventory, you know, a, a metric that Jeff said super important a few minutes ago, which I totally agree with, is lower than uh, both San Antonio and and Houston with only 1.2 months. And um, overall that market uh, has really raised rapidly. And if you drill down a little bit further to either Dallas or Fort Worth, then you're going to see a much higher median price. And that's one of the reasons it's tough to get rentals in the major metros there. The one thing I like about, well, not the only thing, one thing I do like about Dallas is they show days to close, which is basically time to process a mortgage and, um, yeah, that number, I think that number went up three days compared to last month. Um, there's just, and I attribute that a lot to the appraisers. There's just not enough appraisers out there relative to the number of transactions that are happening right now. Um, but anyways, I was, that, that's a neat little thing to include, Dallas only for whatever reason. We, we have a team of agents in Dallas. That, I mean, they, they work some of the Dallas markets, but there are a lot of the, the secondary markets around Dallas that, um, they they pay a lot of attention to that, uh, and the Dallas market the the uh, is strong employment. You got that mm -hmm. you've got that message there in the bottom right of your 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 slide there about them hiring. You know we're hiring here. Um, I you know there's there's not much downside to Dallas, right? You know you you D Dallas is gonna. It just seems like it's a just a uh, a diverse employment base that. If the rest of the country struggles, Dallas 
seems like it 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 can withstand uh, uh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting when you talk about Houston comparing that. Um, we talk with some hedge funds, hedge fund types, or, or you go to these national conventions. Some people have concern about the only gas influence here. Then we work with some other hedge funds that are only buying in Houston. Like this, uh, there's one out of San Francisco just raised, I don't know, $40, $40 million or something specifically to buy properties. And their charter only allows them to buy in Houston, not, not San Antonio, not Dallas. So um, I, I would agree with you that I think there's probably more variability in Houston and economic impact, even though it's cheaper now um, by, by some influences like oil and gas, whereas, you know, uh, Dallas is really a financial hub with a tremendous amount of, of Fortune 500 company headquarters and things. And it is a very resilient economy that's not as based on oil and gas. Prices are going up in oil and gas right now. So maybe that's going to be a, a boom for us potentially coming up in Houston, but uh, more variability. I would agree with that. Yeah. Next, we got a couple minutes left, so I'll try to run through Austin real fast. Uh, Des Destiny showing her face means we need to hurry up. Um, so Austin, uh, you know, like I said, the median sales price is 476. Compare that to the other markets we've been talking about. It's a it's a completely different world, up 30% from last year. Um, sales are down 5%. Um, average days on market is down to 28 days. The thing that I thought was interesting. In the bottom right hand corner, months of inventory is 0 0.4. Mm. <laughs> and that hasn't changed. It's been that way for the last couple of months. So uh, I, I don't know about you, Jeff. We don't see as many single family deals for rentals in Austin, but you do see maybe a, a few more two, three, four unit type of deals because it's easier to cash flow. And it's just, it's tough to cash flow at these prices in Austin. But you get a two, two to four unit, it makes sense. It can, but even those are hard. Even those are difficult to to come up with. I mean, it's it. Austin is just such a tight market. Um, it, it, well, the inventory right there. I mean, that's yeah, less than a half a month. That's it, a shocking number, right? I mean, I mean, if I mean, I, I mean, what what does that mean? It means that if nothing else came on the market, they'd be out of properties to sell in two weeks. <laughs> it's hard to imagine yeah and you think you think these numbers and uh you know the other major metros seem really low historically they are incredibly low 1.2 1.4 1.5 but you know austin is just off the charts uh let's go to the next slide uh it's really for buy and hold investors it's really more it's still a great flip market but um Buy and hold it is definitely tough there. So this affordability index, we often cover it. And there has been some movement, you know, uh, so many people are moving into ask Austin, uh, Dallas, Houston, that those cities are moving up the charts. But, you know, you're talking at Dallas, top five or six city, Houston, top five or six city in many areas, population, job opportunities, opportunities for culture and entertainment. And, and so significantly below the other cities that you would consider their national peers you know the miami's new york's los angeles um those those are incredibly unaffordable so this this actually should probably be called uh, to just point earlier before we got on the call this is actually the unaffordability index not necessarily the affordability index because if you're number one that means you're extremely unaffordable but um this is why we think in addition to a, a dearth of houses very few houses um that are out there right now the fact that uh, you have all of these great amenities and opportunities in, in the major metros across Texas, and then you have incredibly affordable properties. And another thing that's not baked in here is tax rates, right? If you look at uh, the Texas cities and you look at the percentage of income required for a mortgage payment, it's, it's also not baking in that it's easier to have more of your money to put towards your mortgage payment whenever you're not taxed an extra 12, 13, 14% for, for state income tax, right? So really that's why we're seeing a, a lot of movement here. And even if national or international factors cause some problems for real estate, there's a lot of tailwinds behind Texas in general, and especially Houston and San Antonio for real estate long-term investors. Yeah, Anything to add to that, Jeff, before we go to questions? Sorry, Jeff, I'm sorry. 
That's okay. Just the one thing I did notice, if you look at the income, if you look at Austin relative to the other cities, I mean, $20,000 more than Dallas, Houston. Plano is like a, an anomaly because I think it's a pretty small market, but um, they're just making a lot more money in Austin as well. All the new jobs coming in, it's a, it's a high income um, economy. Yeah. All righty, thank you guys so much for joining us. We are gonna jump into questions, but before we do, we have a very fun announcement. We are going to select our winner for the half off your hard money processing fee with Catalyst funding. And our winner is Bonnie Wells, congratulations. We will shoot you an email after this and uh, have any details and questions will be included. But if you have any, reach out to us directly. Um, next, I will try to make this speedy. We don't have a ton of questions this time, so I think we're a little okay that we ran over. Um, everyone will get a copy of this recording sent to them via email tomorrow. I've had a few people ask, don't worry, you'll get a copy. If you have additional questions or anything deal specific, again, remember to reach out. We have fully licensed loan officers that are available to assist you. And Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. This contact information is here, but is there anything you want to add for somebody to reach out and contact you? Well, yeah, I, I, uh, last thing I would say is if you go to that website for lifestylesunlimited.com, I would encourage everyone to uh, attend our expo next month. Oh, yeah. um, th there's a button on the top of that website to go to our expo. Um, meet, f find me out, meet, I'll be there. Meet me, you guys will be there too. So, um, um, you know, find us, hang out with us, get, get to know us in person. Um, it, it, it's good to be back, uh, to, to live stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on there. I think there's four days of just lots of real estate stuff to do. So go, go, go get to, go get to that expo link and, and, uh, and sign up for it. It's a lot, a lot of fun yep. stuff to do. We will be there. We'll be at that expo at the George R. Brown in Houston next month. Um, actually, we're almost a little under a month out because I think it is the 17th through 19th, if I'm going correct off of uh, memory here. But yeah, definitely check it out. It is a great networking opportunity and educational opportunity. Um, in fact, Jeff and Wade will be speaking there too. So you guys can uh, hear from them and talk to them directly in person as well. Now I will go ahead and jump into questions and thank you everyone that is hanging in there a little past time. We apologize for that. Um, the first question that we have, how do you see the competition with REITs and Zillow of the world impacting the market? This one's well, open for anyone. Um, one of them's I done. That, I think Zillow proved in many ways that it is very, very difficult for national uh, companies to invest in single family real estate. Um, they were paying too much and they got caught in a pickle and candidly, they weren't paying that much more than some of the other people like OfferUp and uh, some of these other places. Uh, so uh, there's a reason that despite major uh, hedge funds, private equity funds, REITs wanting to get into the space that 88% of properties are owned by, uh, you know, mom and pop investors. And I think that's a trend that that it's going to be difficult to change. There's a lot of desire to change it because all these people are chasing yield, but it's not easy to rehab homes all across the country. It's not easy to know the markets as well as we can here locally. And it's just, uh, it can be done, but it's not as easy, right? Jeff, anything to add to that? Yeah, well, Zillow failed miserably. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, uh, I, you know, I've sold several of the, of my personal properties to some of these funds and I don't know how they're, I, I, I don't understand their business model. There, there's no sane investor that would pay what they're paying. I can't, I, I, I can't, um, adv I couldn't advise one of my investor clients to pay what they're paying. Um, and I, so I, I don't think they're gonna, I don't think they're a permanent fixture in our space. Awesome, thanks guys. 
Um, our next question is, are you seeing incentives for green certified properties? That's a fun question. I'm, we've never had that question. In, in the multifamily space, yes. In the multifamily yeah. space, there are um, there are some um, uh, incentives that are, in many cases, well worth it to make to make those kinds of renovations to the properties. Not so much in single family yet. Okay, great. Um, and then we have one catalyst specific. Uh, and maybe this is too specific, but we didn't have a ton of questions today, so I'll go ahead and ask this one. Um, does Catalyst have loan products for veterans who want to use VA loans to purchase two to four units uh, of single family or two to four unit single family houses? I am unsure of a VA loan can be used in that way because we've not seen that request very often, but we do offer um, all of the products. Uh, we are definitely conforming loan specialists because that's what most of the mentorship organizations like Lifestyles Unlimited encourage. But um, we definitely do have the ability to provide VA loans. Okay, great. Well, that concludes our questions for today. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining Destiny, us. Destiny, can I, can I ask you again? I want to make sure I heard that right. What was the name of the drawing winner? Just go back up. Why is that someone you know? I think so. You might have to draw again. If that was my mom, you got to draw again. <laughs> What's the name? Last name was Wells. I'm looking. My I mom's last name is Wells. That's definitely mom. <laughs> okay, wow. they might have In, Inside off. job. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if she's still on the call, so I can't see it here anymore. Um, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will find out. I will get with. You Jeff might have to draw call. again. <laughs> if, uh, if it is his mother, then be sure to check your email because uh, we will select a new winner. How funny. <laughs> oh, that's great. You have a very supportive family. Thanks for joining us, Mrs. Wells. Yes. <laughs> yes. All okay, right, guys. Everybody. Well, yeah. Have a good day. Have a great day. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it, brother.